Hey guys, Dr. B. Here's a mini lecture on genetic linkage and recombination. So uh, most of these are pictures, but a few of these are words. Uh, this is one, so you can pause the video if you need to. But the big point about all this is when um, genes are on different chromosomes or far apart on the same, they're said to be independent um, or unlinked, and that makes sense. When they're close together, they're said to be linked. And this is an example we talked about with like humans with the gene that controls hair color um, and freckles very close together, and they're considered linked. And we can basically figure out um, if genes are linked based on recombinants, which is the offspring that do not look like either parent, and then we can make a map from it. So how do we do it? Um, to back the truck up a little bit, obviously homologous chromosomes, I assume you're aware of this um, and that basically each of your parents gave you one copy of one chromosome so if the, this happens to be chromosome 7 for whatever maybe you got this one from mom this one from dad the genes are all the same but there may be different alleles or versions of them maybe dad gave you this version of a and maybe mom gave you that and so based on the way that um, these homologous pairs um, during meiosis will happen, they will be double, and you get a situation like this. And then, of course, each of these individuals would then go into a sperm or an egg. Um, so that's just a little backup. And if it works properly, you basically get this. You get the idea that, again, mom and dad gave you one of each. They then duplicate. They go through meiosis 1. Then they go through meiosis 2. And you'll note that all of the gametes basically, ha and you can pause this, uh, slide if you need to. Um, it's going to show about 25% of all the different versions of this, and that's exactly what makes sense in normal meiosis, um, that when these genes are far apart, um, you, we tend to get 25% of all of these, and notice that one parent or the other had all of these versions. So if you go through and find these, you'll find a parent that has one or the other, um, and that's normal. Link genes, of course, are when they're very close together. Um, Crossing over still occurs, but basically the gamete uh, numbers are different. And because they stick together, um, we tend to call them linked. And so let's do an example of that. So here's a perfect example of genes that are close together on the same chromosome of A and B. And you can see that those two genes are very close together. Um, and you wouldn't really know it until you you had a situation where offspring looked like this. And you'll note that... Um, I'm only showing you this video to get you the idea of the recombinants. Um, the a, this large A, large B, and small A, small B are not considered recombinants. The reason why is that if you look, one of the parents has both of these. Neither parent has a combination of a big A and a little B, or a little A and a big B, and that's why they're considered recombinant. Um, and so that just kind of straightens up the word of what recombination means, right? So. With these very short distances, basically there's targets for crossover events, and basically we can figure that out. This happens during prophase one of meiosis, and sometimes, rarely, um, we get recombination situations where these do switch little pieces of a chromosome. And you can see here that this right here and this right here is not a chromosome style that is owned by either parent. So if any, any offspring gets this chromosome or this one, they're going to be considered recombinant. So how do we do that? First thing we get is we got to make a heterozygote. So we start off here, and this is a completely purebred. Um, in this case, the sex is irrelevant. Um, we have a normal red eye, and we have a normal wing, right? So those are the two basic things that we're looking at here. Uh, and in this case, by the way, the PR plus, the plus, as you remember, stands for wild type. So that means in this case, the the normal eye color for flies is red, right? We then cross that with a complete recessive, which of course is going to be purple eyes and little vestigial wings. And predictably speaking, like a very simple Punnett square, we're going to get a heterozygote who looks just like the dominant, except what we know about this person now is it's going to be heterozygote. It's going to have one copy of the chromosome that was dominant and one copy that's recessive for both. And you can clearly see that this offspring got one of these actual entire chromosomes from, we'll call it, in this case, mom, and in this case, got it from dad, and so that's why it looks just like uh, the mom, and or the and that's obviously not new for you. Hopefully, you get that. That's just a simple dihybrid cross. Now, here's how we do it. So we take that heterozygote, 
when we cross it, which is called a test cross, and that's always done with a homozygous recessive, one that's the most recessive thing. And so we can see basically what happens to the alleles of the other one. And so when we do that, when we cross these two, here's what we might get. And here's the normal cross, and again, here's the normal chromosomes. Um, we'd expect to get, you know, obviously a, a value of these that was 25% of each, but we don't. Notice the values are way off. And the reason why is that, notice we have a situation here where we have a red-eyed but vestigial winged fly. If you look at the parents, neither parent has red eyes and vestigial wing. This parent has red eyes and normal wings. This parent has purple eyes and vestigial wings. This is the same case here. Normal wings, but not normal eyes. And so these two are considered recombinants because the only way that could have caused that had there been a crossing over in these particular uh, situations of the genes in the sperm or the egg. And so we consider those recombinants. And so how we basically determine um, that situation, first of all, we'll notice here, again, how do we determine it? Um, they're not produced in equal numbers, which like the Punnett square would tell us. Obviously, it would give us 25% in all, but it didn't turn out that way. And so basically, that's how we consider these genes linked, that they're close enough that they were actually separated. So how do we do it? From this, we actually take what the recombination frequency, which is the recombinants over the total, and we can see here that we have 151 recombinants and 154 recombinants, which is going to give us 305 recombinants out of the total amount of recombinants. I don't know how big that is, but it's a lot. Um, you add all four, and you multiply by 100%, and you get 10.7. So basically, that 10.7 also equates to the distance apart that the PR and the VG gene are on a chromosome. They're 10.7 map units apart. So, based on that, if we take a look at just an example, let's just grab three genes, A, B, and C, and after the same types of situations as this, right, we end up finding that recombination values for A to B are 13.2%, right? Looking at B and C was 6.4, and looking at A and C was 18.5, right? So basically, what do we do from this point? We figure A and, A and B is 13.2, so that's a done deal. So C, where do we put C? C could be on this side, or it can be on this side. But the reason we know it's on this side is it's only 6.4% or units, map units away from B, and therefore also 18.5 away from A, and it makes it work. So hopefully that little, uh, this little video helps. If you have any questions, let me know.